Explore Request mode has ended. Hello everybody, we're back. This is Tammy Stone with um, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity and I'm going to be talking with you about the job training and economic development request for application. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Like I said, um, JTED um, is, is um, designed for community-based organizations. They are the eligible applicants. So I wanted to make that um, clear up front as we get going. Um, for anybody that's new to the call, just a few uh, little items. Um, if you're having a hard time with your your sound, if you're listening to the computer and you're having a difficult time hearing, you can go to the right-hand side of the screen and there is a little uh, phone icon and you can call in direct. The number is 866-821-1611. And then please be sure to mute, mute your computer screen so you don't have any feedback or echoing um, as a result of that. There is the file share window, which is on the left-hand side to the bottom, um, which has digital divide um, uh, files and JTED files. Um, so please go through that. You can download, save those to your computer. Um, there is the actual application um, for submittal, the Word document. Uh, there is the application information form, and the PowerPoint presentation is loaded up on there, and then the JTED flyer is on there. So please download those documents um, for your, your reference back at your desk. Um, else um, we are going to have a question and answer to the uh, left-hand side again. There is a Q&A section where you can uh, post questions. Um, you can post them as we're going and we can also post them at the end. So when we get done with the presentation, if there's any specific questions that you have, we can, we can respond to those at the end of the presentation. So. Yeah, and you, your, your phones are muted, so um, you, you can't can ask questions through the phone. Um, um, so if you have any questions that you need to post, please post them in the Q&A. And then at the end of the session, we are also going to be um, um, posting this on Illinois WorkNet, so all the questions that you have posted, we'll also type out and have them, have them on the Illinois WorkNet site. Um, back in 1998, and it was authorized under Public Law 9474. And we're going to go through our meeting discussions. And we're basically going to talk about the program description and requirements. That we're going to the submission form, and then what our selection criteria is. linking low-wage, low-skilled, employed are the lower wage disadvantaged individuals with jobs, basically, with people, local employers that have specific needs um, for their for their employment, um, and then working with local industries to determine, um, you know, what areas are are relevant and and critical for develop, developing these training programs. Like I said, once again, an eligible applicant has to be a not for profit profit organization, community based organization. You need to have a local board of directors. Um, you have to have experience in directly providing job training services. That doesn't necessarily mean that the training is provided in-house. You may contract out with other training providers, but you have to have experience in working with job training um, programs. Um, and you have to have a history of working with low-wage, low-skilled individuals or economically disadvantaged um, populations. The 
was in the funded through we have two funding sources has been funded Customer is the employer. Um, they, they identify the employers and work with the employers, and then the employers identify the employees that need specific skill upgrades. So there's a very, very strong relationship and collaboration, ship, uh, collaboration between um, the community-based organization and the employer. Then the employers, like I said, will identify specific employees that, that have, specific, have skills that need to be upgraded to meet the employer's needs. Um, there's going to be a collaboration between the community-based organization and the employer to determine what the curricula is, um, what the training needs are, um, and, and administering the training, and then in following up um, after the training has been uh, performed to figure out what the results are of the training. So in many cases with your Category 1, um, the employers may provide um, facility, they may provide the specific equipment or tools that they have. Um, for the people to be trained on. Um, they may provide the curriculum to the community-based organization if they have specific curriculum. If they have a new piece of machinery that has been brought into their organization um, with, with you know, procedures manuals, um, that can be provided by the employer. Um, so there's a very strong uh, relationship and an involvement in the employer in this particular case. Basically, the outcomes. What we want to see with a Category 1 program is that there is a skill up. See that, you know, there may be a career path that's avail available to them as a result of the um, skill training, and that there is an increase in the capacity and the production of the employers. Ultimately, a better skilled workforce for the employer will increase their capacity and their, their ability to produce. So that's, that's the intended outcome of this particular program. Um, to give you an example of something that has been funded in the past, which has been a very good um, relationship for Category 1, is a community-based organization that has partnered, partnered with um, McDonald's, and they have a program that's called English Under the Arches. And what the employer, um, the franchises identify current employees that have the ability to move up their management track, but because of um, language deficiencies, they're not able to, to go that path. So they've developed a program with a community-based organization to um, introduce English as a second language to be able to take these individuals um, and, and work with them in the McDonald's environment and increase their language capacity and then be able to incorporate them into the management um, um, track in McDonald's. So that's just one example of, of a collaboration be the, between a community-based organization and the local employer. Um, for Category 1, there is a 250... Like with McDonald's, the franchise does not employ more than 250 individuals. Uh, for Category 1, you have to target employees that have 250 or less employees at that location. Um, and this is just, this is an administrative rule that we've had, you know, for quite a few years with this which is equivalent to or
Basically, for Category 1, you're looking at a client that has an, um, an hourly wage of $16.68 or less to be eligible um, for this particular program. And the chart below just shows you, the, this is the, um, the income guidelines, and the, you look at the family size of three to, to calculate that, that number. And it's a footnote below that indicates how we come up with that. Um, HHS has just released new income guidelines. And so this number will change, but it will be um, July 1st is when we'll implement this. So anybody that currently runs a JTED program or JTED programs that are going to be um, starting um, with this new contract, um, July 1st will be the date that that new income guideline will, will take into effect. Okay. For program category two, the grantees are going to be working with uh, unemployed, economically disadvantaged individuals. And some of the activities um, that will be involved with that is the community-based organization needs to do an analysis of their local community and determine where basically the jobs are needed. Um, the, the end result of this is, is employment. So the training needs to be targeted to, to, to something that is going to put these people in jobs. Um, so the community-based organizations doesn't do an evaluation of their, their area. They, they hone in on what they feel is a significant need for the employers in that area. Um, it may require working with um, a local chamber of commerce. It may um, be working with local um, um, area and also be able to individuals, what are the skill sets that they need, um, basically developing what is the curriculum, what is implemented um, that meets those employers' needs. Um, and then um, increasing those skill levels for those particular, particular individuals. But what the outcome of this basically is, is that you're increasing the skill level of a person that, that doesn't have a skill set or a low skill set that has been, you know, potentially chronically unemployed, um, giving them um, the opportunity to be productive and get it into the workforce by providing a specific skill set to them. Um, you're helping the local employers because, you know, they're, they're in a position where they need an employee with that, that skill set. Um, JTED, when it was originally established, the um, environment was a lot different than the environment is today with the recession. Um, when it was established, there was more of a shortage of workforce, and, and um, the employers were probably in the workforce for the employees. And, I, and it is a little bit more difficult with Category 2 in this environment, um, you know, with getting these individuals into that, into that employment stream because there is, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, more people available for, for jobs at this point. Um, so you really need to be very specific in what you're looking at um, and, and what you're targeting to do with this training program so it does result in jobs for these people at the end. a relationship very 150 days nine can sustainable they can Okay, for the ex be on cash
on food stamps. They can fall. Now, and let's see if I can get my pointer. On this side is the eligibility. So what you're going to be looking at is um, the family unit size, and then uh, Um, oh, we are your I first. Okay, the or has I did health care manuf So oh, um, basically what this means is when after and has good jobs. Um, local workforce investment boards can also identify additional sectors. Um, an area that we do provide programs for in the Chicago area is obviously hospitality, um, um, you know, or um, um, food service industry because um, depending upon what the the environment is and what kind of employers they have in that area. So we do not discount any applications if they're outside of the sector. It's just that we do give extra points. Um, and then if you do if you are falling outside of the sector in the application, you, you know you need to really be strong in and um, the rationale of, of why you're going with that sector. You know, it's, it's either there's a, a very strong employer that you've partnered with that has job opportunities that will, put, you know, work with you and place these people if they have that specific training um, skill set. So just, just, just indicate that in your application. Okay, we're going to go into the application requirements. As um, Caesar had mentioned in his, his uh, presentation, the department has come up Um, our that um, Application, and I'm going to toggle between my presentation and the actual application. Um, there's just some specific areas that I want to point out to you. Section one of the application is just basically ap applicant information. Um, you're going to provide us with the applicant name. Um, one of the things, let me see if I can get my pointer here for you. There we go. Well, I'm having trouble getting my pointer up there. Sorry, guys. Okay, right there where the pointer is, the chief officer 
Um, we have gone, for the last probably two or three years, the department has gone to an e-grant system. And we're, we're maintaining everything um, within our e-grant. And one of the things that we've gotten very stringent on is um, making sure that the authorized signator um, is, is on like all reporting and all grant signatures and everything. So when you're filling this out, the chief officer, what I'd like to see there who is whoever is authorized to sign your contract. Um, um, now when we go into the granting process, you can designate other individuals to be authorized signatories. But I want this to be the, the, the key person, the, the individual, it may be the CEO, it may be um, you know, a president, it may be the uh, CFO that is the key person that, that has the authorization to do sign contracts. That's what I want to see there. You're going to be entering your NAICS code. If you have, an, have a website, you know, we would love to see you have your website entered there. Um, you do need to enter a DUNS number um, in here. And one of the requirements that we have now is also it's called a central contractor registration. If you've had a grant with us, especially during the ARA um, program with the stimulus funding, you probably you've had a central contractor registration. They do expire annually. So you need to make sure that you are registered with a central contractor registration. Um, and you do need a DUNS number to complete that. Um, and like I said, that is an annual thing, so you know you may want to check your your CCR and make sure that it's it's still good. Um, but you can you can Google it. You can Google CCR or you can Google Central Contractor Registration, and then you'll be able to find that page of where that that information is at. Um, we also need your your uh, fiscal year date. So if it's a June one through May thirty, we need to know what your fiscal year is, um, and that's required when we start doing the granting process. Um, there's some demographic information. They, uh, there's some demographic information regarding the population that you're serving. To me, that's more of a reporting side question than, than an application question in some cases. But fill that out to the best of your ability. Um, give us an idea of what those demographics are going to be like for the population that you plan on serving. Then we're going to go into the applicant history. Um, once again, uh, this, is, this is just a lot of different questions that are here. The instructions are at the back of the application, so follow the instructions. The main thing that I want to point out here is um, find that section. And actually, I'm sorry. The, the, what I wanted to point out was under section um, 1.4, description of applicant. There's an area that asks you to describe the applicant, what the type of business is, what its history is, what its clientele is. It's a 200 character minimum in that section. And in that section, I want you to keep it, keep it somewhat brief, because I do have another section where we're going to go into more detail on, on your applicant history, and that's going to be in the um, program specific section. But w I do want to know, um, you know, you know, summary details about your, your, um, your organization, the applicant, under 1.4. Okay, section two, like I said, the applicant history is pretty self-explanatory. And it's, you know, who are your, your officers? Is there any um, liens? Is there any, um, do you have grants with them? Um, and to um, explain that. Um, this particular part of the form isn't really user friendly, so it's probably much easier for you if you have numerous grants within the last three years to, to include that as an attachment to this um, because it's not a real user friendly area there in um, 2.1. So you can include that as an attachment um, to this document. Okay, moving on, under section three, that's running a little too fast there, sorry guys. Under section three, we're actually uh, requesting proposal information. The main thing I want to uh, point out here is under 3.3, .3, it says brief program description. You have like, I think, 550 characters or something there. 
I want to I want it to be concise but descriptive. And what you're going to be providing me there, there, there may be um, opportunities where you're going to be having maybe two programs, two training programs. We funded agencies before that maybe had like a um, a woodworking training program, and they also had a, a shipping and receiving program. So it was two very distinct programs that they, they came in for. But in this particular area, I want a description of both programs, and I want it to be concise but descriptive. Um, this could be something that I could pull out, potentially use in your scope of work um, when we're developing the scope of work. So you know, let me know what the training is, um, who's being served, um, you know, how many would be enrolled, and kind of a duration of training. Um, you know, if, if you were going to provide a paragraph or, or you know, something to um, somebody that didn't know anything about your program, um, you know, but keep it within a paragraph or two, you know, that's, that's what we're looking for there. If I was going to provide a description to a um, outside, a legislator or somebody that wanted to know something about the program, something that's concise but descriptive. Um, the program period, like I had indicated, is going to start um, um, June 1 of this year, 2011, and it'll end March 31st of 2013. It's a two-year grant. Um, the intent of that is in a training program, we want to make sure there's plenty of time to complete the training, and then we have to have a retention component of it. There has to be a 90-day or 150-day non-consecutive retention. So we want to make sure there's plenty of time to complete the training and also to, um, to, to meet those goals. And then we're going to go into this application a little further. I'll talk about the, um, the performance goals that are associated with this. You'll notice here. Specific information. And somebody asked about repeating the grant period. The grant period is going to be um, June 1 of 2011 through May 31st of 2013. So it's a two-year grant cycle. Written for complete training. Then for category. That's for both category one and two. And then for category Category two, the added one is employment. For category one, it's uh, wage increase. But they share the enrollment. For each of these benchmarks that apply to the category. And then we take the entire uh, amount that you're requesting, and we just take it by, um, divide it by uh, five. So 20% of the grant is, is attributed to each of the benchmarks. And then you're going to take the number of participants, and I can point to, to the pointer here. You're going to take the number of participants, um, and you're going to divide the 20% the, um, of the funding request, and you're going to come up with an attributed cost per participant. So if you had um, you know, 10 people that you were enrolling, um, and you had um, your, your grant was going to be, say, 
$50,000. So $10,000 of it would be, be attributed to the number of people enrolled in training. And then that attributed cost would be $1,000. So you would have $100,000, or you'd have $1,000, I'm sorry, you would have $10,000 in your requested funds with 10 people, and then so that would be a tribute to cost save $1,000 for enrollment. Um, this is basically the, um, your performance, this is, this is kind of the meat for us too. It, it, this is what you're telling us, this is what you're going to be able to accomplish is, with your program. Um, and then on the back side, if say for example you missed um, um, retention by one, we would take the attributed cost, and that attributed cost would be considered dis disallowed cost to the grant. So whatever that cost was in that column would be disallowed cost to the grant, and at the end of the, the grant, when we do closeouts, and that would be something that would have to be returned to the department as a disallowed cost to the grant. Because like I said, this is a performance-based grant. Um, we're, we're judging you on the five measures um, and, and how you complete those measures. And once again, JTED is a competitive grant. So um, each year, this you know it's pretty well the slates you know washed clean, and and then new grantees come in, and we judge them based upon their applications. And it's a competitive grant. So once you sign the grant with us, um, there are really besides maybe a date extension that which we've done you know just one time. There's no modifications really to the grant um, because it's a competitive, and we and we we chose. way. You can't go say that you're going to be training, you know, um, in the medical field and then want to jump ship and go to um, uh, manufacturing. Um, you have to stay focused on what we negotiated in, in the grant originally. Not to say, though, that if you have extra elements that are related to the training, um, that they can be implemented into it. So an example would be for a Category 1 uh, grant that's working with an, em an employer in manufacturing, um, and then they bring in uh, a specific new piece of equipment or something that they need some additional training on. You can incorporate um, some additional curriculum as long as it's related to the scope of what you're, what you're doing. Okay. Under Section 6, um, Projected Employment Impact, this is dealing with your organization. So it says the number of um, permanent full-time individuals currently employed and the number of part-time individuals employed by the applicant. And then down below, it talks about the number of permanent full-time jobs that would be created by the applicant as a direct result of receiving the grant. So this is going to be a number of jobs you're creating in your organization as a result of receiving this grant um, or retaining. Um, this isn't the number of people you're training. This is the specific impact of what this grant is having on your, um, your, your employment. Um, and that number probably won't be very big, um, and we don't anticipate a big number there, but it's directly related, related to the hires of the, of the applicant. Um, I'm just looking at the questions here real quick. Okay, we have a question. What is a reasonable number of industries you would expect um, for us to target? And about 500 available that comes from the WIA discretionary area that funds Category 1. Um, so you have to be really reali realistic and focused um, with this training. Um, you can have multiple sectors, um, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't get into serving five or six or seven different sectors because I think you're spreading yourself too thin um, when you start looking at, at doing, you know, a lot of different types of training programs. Okay, I see we have some people with some webinar issues. Hopefully those are being taken care of. Okay, the budget. Um, under Section 7, we want you to provide your really not enough money for equipment. So, and
um, you know, supply training that you're, you're, you're providing. Um, contractual direct training, you know, if you're subcontracting out the training with a community college or another training provider, that would fall under there, um, or any contractual for other services. Um, if you're if you're in-house training provider, then the um, cost will fall under your personnel and fringe benefits. So the cost for anything that's done in-house will fall under personnel and fringe. Um, if there's any matching funds, this is going to show up on the matching side for the grant. We do um, like to see matching funds, especially in Category 1, because Category 1 is uh, uh, you know, definitely a direct benefit to specific employers because there's that relationship, strong relationship, between the Category 1 um, um, grantee and the employer because technically the, the client is the employer in that particular situation. So we do score a little higher you know, for Category 1 grantees if they have matching funds. Um, category 2, we like to see it too. So. And in the application, there's multiple areas. Let me get my pointer here, and I'll show you. There is um, a total here. So under this column here is the requested grant amount from DCEO, and there's a, that, there's that total right there. And then when we go up and we look at your performance measures, When we add, add up, there's not a total in this column, but we will add up these columns to, to see that this total amount in these columns match the total in your budget. There's also under section, let me pull it here, um, section 3.8 of the application, it asks for the re um, funds requested from DC, uh, DCEO. That's a total there. Um, make sure all your totals match. Um, you know, we do have applications where we get one total under Section 3.8, and then, and then if we add up the performance measures, we come up with another total, and then if we look down at the budget, we have a different total. So just make sure that, you know, when you're doing your numbers that, that they, they total in all parts of this application. Um, we have a question. Uh, so matching funds are not required. They are not required. But like I said, especially for cat Category 1, we give like extra points if you have matching funds in, in our review. Category 2, um, we like to see them, but it's not, it's not required and we don't weight that in a cat Category 2 grant. Um, and I have another question, is there a cap on the requested grant amount? There is not a cap. Uh, what we have done in the past couple years, we've had a, uh, we've had a minimum. So if you were a new grantee, you were not brought in under $50,000 was the minimum. Um, but keep in mind that we're looking between the two funding sources at about $1.9 million that's available. And traditionally, we've, we've funded between 23 to 24 funded around $150,000. So um, just keep it you know, in perspective, um, you know, don't come in for anything like a $500,000 um, request. Um, and I have another question, is there a minimum of training participants? We, there is not a minimum number of people to be trained. Every training program costs are higher, um, number of participants are lower. So we look at each training program individually to something somewhere else. Um, we'll take a look at that. So you need to you need to keep your average cost real, um, and 
there's no, I mean, there's, we funded programs before where they may have served 10 people. Um, um, but just, just keep that in mind. It's, there's, no, there's no minimum as far as, or maximum as far as participants served. You just have to really evaluate your program. Okay, and I have one more question. I'll go ahead and answer this. Is the amount that Category one. and it's based upon the meeting of their benchmarks. Um, and that's because it's funded through, through, through federal sources. Category two is funded through state GRS. Um, for this calendar year, we have to have the funds obligated by June 30th. So it's a forward fund. program, which means the Category 2 participants need to be very diligent in keeping track of how they're managing this program. Um, because and it is a two-year contract, so that, you know, that is spread out until, um, you know, the, the end of the contract. But we will require quarterly reports. Um, we're going to be require trial balances from your accounting system showing how these expenditures are being met. Um, we keep, um, at our level, we keep the, the expenditures based upon your benchmarks, not necessarily your trial balance, but we, we collect your trial balances to see how, how, you're spending, how you're spending your funds. So I just want to make it very clear that, especially for the Category 2, you have to be very diligent in managing these grants. So that way, if for some reason you don't meet performance, that there's funds available to return. And the obligation date, again, these, these will have to be obligated by June 30th. So the contracts will be, will be done and it will be obligated no later than June 30th. Okay. Now we're going to get into the program specific um, section. And for anyone that has completed a JTED application, even like last year, this is, this is um, what you're familiar with. Um, under Section 8, Organizational Experience, this is where I want a little bit more detail regarding your organization, um, who you are, what your mission is, what your um, give, give organization and your annual budget. Um, and skill deficiencies. This is where you're going to tell us who, what, what, what you're going to do, what industries you're going to um, be, be serving. Um, Um, what the skill deficiencies are in those areas and how, you, how you're going to um, uh, meet those skill deficiencies. Um, you're going to indicate what the average position um, or the, the availability of the positions, the availability of promotion, um, and the wage rates and the potential. The, the targeted industries and the occupations. Below that, we have the em employer's role in planning, training, placement, and promotion. Um, like I said, for Category 1, there's a very tight relationship between the, um, the community-based organization and the employer. So we want to know 
Um, what is the role of the employer in assessing the employee's skill needs and developing the, the curriculum um, and coordinating the training? Um, facility. They think, you know, within the grant. them in the curriculum development and, and including them in the training. Um, with a category two, um, and, and partnership. In this case, you're going to be describing the Um, and I do have in there include a list of um, employers and I didn't finish my sentence there. You can You're identifying the employers here um, that you're going to be incorporating into this program. And then right below that is a description of the relationships um, for other, other providers. If you're going to be working with, say, a union that's going to help you with placement, if you're working with um, a, different, a training provider, a community college, how you're identifying those people, how you're bringing them to the table, how they're becoming a partner in, in, a, uh, in this, particular training type, this particular training program, what their involvement is with that. And that's more, like I said, the methodology of how you're developing these relationships. I don't necessarily want the list here, um, more of a methodology of how you're establishing it. Then we're going to get into an actual training program format. Um, in the document, um, there is the one format that's incorporated in, in the, the front part. At the very back of the document, I've provided extra copies of this. So if you're doing more than one training program, if you're proposing more than one training program, then there's extra documents at the back for that because I want this to be related to specific training. So if you're coming in and you're doing something in, you know, um, uh, a pharmacy tech program, and then you're also doing a forklift program, then there would be two different um, forms of this filled out. You're going to provide the training name and the industry that's going to be served. And you're going to give me a number of individuals that are going to be in, and anticipated to be enrolled, you know, the midpoint completion, employed, retained for this training program. Now, if you're providing more than one training program, um, those numbers are going to roll up, and they're going, to, um, they're going to be a total in that Section 5 that we already went through. So in Section 5, performance measures is a total of everybody that you're training. In this particular format, you're going to break it out based upon the training program. Um, under summary, give me a summary of the training program, um, how it's meeting the specific industry needs. If there's a population that you're serving, if you're targeting a population, let me know what that population is, um, what the intended outcome is of that. So in the summary, once again, it's going to be brief but descriptive, so I know um, what you're doing. And then you're going to identify the activities. And this is just the meat of the training. What, what, are you, what are you doing? What's the training materials you're using? Is it going to be classroom training? Is it OJC? Is it vocational? Are you, are you providing apprenticeship? Um, is there certifications you know, from this? Are, are you, you know, if you're doing um, um, you know, CNA, are they going to be CNA certified? Are they going to be uh, um, um, BP, or, um, performance um, BPI? There we go. Thank you. Um, what kind of certifications are they going to be receiving from this? 
Um, what is the expected outcome and long-range benefits of them by participating in this? Um, what's the um, if you if somebody if an outside training provider is, is being contracted with you know um, how are how are they selected and um, and what are the resources that they are bringing to the table and describe the method of selecting this training. Um, Describe the process of identifying who's going into the training. Um, like I said, this grant is not a huge grant, and you really need to be focused with this. And and you need to, you know, you need to do pre-assessments of individuals. You want individual. You don't want to put somebody in a training program that's going to hate it when they get out or going to drop out in midpoint. They need to have. You know what they want to do. You don't want to place somebody in a, you know, a pharmacy tech position that really wants construction. Um, so you, want to, you really want to do pre-assessments and give the opportunity to people that really are interested in that type of a job, job opportunity. Um, if they're co-enrolled in other programs, and that does happen. I mean, JSA is not a huge program, so they may be co-enrolled in other programs. Um, you know, are there other programs that, that they're being co-enrolled in? And then under that, we have the um, occupation summary. So you're going to be listing the occupations you're training for, the existing wage rate, um, the duration of training, and I want the number of hours and the number of weeks, um, and then the average cost per participant. That average cost, you know, is, you're going to have to calculate that. That's kind of a loose number. Um, but we want to kind of see where you're coming in with an average cost for that occupation. Um, and you may have multiple occupations under that. You may, you may only have one. You may be doing, um, you know, a bilingual medical assistant, which is, you know, what one of our organizations have done in the past. Um, or you may have three or four different occupations that you're training for. So we want that listed out. And then under that section, this is where our employers are coming in. We want you to list your employer partners. Um, and, and occupations. If you are working with a manufacturer and, um, um, I don't know, you may have two different occupations that you're training for under that manufacturer, we want that listed there. And if there's going to be any employer match. So for this particular training program, I want you to list the employers that, that you're, um, you're going to be partnering with um, and who these individuals will be placed with in jobs. Um, and then under that, we have our uh, partners, other partners. So if you're working with um, a training provider, you know, if you're, if you're contracting out with another training provider, I want to know who they are and, and um, what their role is in that. Um, if you're working And I did find one error in my application, Donna. There's probably more than one. that you can tab into that. So I'm going to have to um, fix that, and um, I'm going to have to resend that out to everybody, and I'm also going to um, post it on our website. But I did notice that there is a box missing for data entering that, and I'm sorry about that. Um, if you find any other problems or concerns with the application, please let me know. Um, like I said, this is our first time implementing this into the, the DCO application. So it is a controlled application. It's locked down. You can only enter information where we let you enter information. And it, it has been a little bit of a challenge um, trying to get what we need um, and also meet the, the requirements of a universal app. OK, and then moving on, um, we have the budget and cost justification. Um, going a little too fast there. Once again, you're going to just give us the dollar amounts, which was, which, which was included in Section 7, and make sure they match. Um, and you're going to give us a cost justification of, of why you're spending that money and how you're spending it. Um, under supplies, if you have um, you know, $2,000 or whatever under supplies, then you're going to break it out and explain what those supplies are going to be used for. Um, under your personnel, you're going to break out your personnel costs and let us know the amount of time that this has been spent. You know. Um, um, on personnel and your fringe benefits. If you're doing contractual, 
you need to let us know how much you're spending and who you're, who you're contracting with in this section. Um, and then once again, this information will um, eventually roll into your own trial balances. So when we do our reporting and you're requested to submit a trial balance, then I should be able to see something similar to this in your trial balance sheet of how the costs are being expended. And then the application signature, it does need to be signed by the, um, um, the authorized signature on this particular document too. It needs to be named and dated. Um, the best way to do this, and, and you can include attachments to this. You can include, you're going to need to include your, um, 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 your, your 501c3, the, the, uh, the proof that you're not for Um, and send it all back as one attachment. And I'm just going to show you there is instructions. We're just going to cruise through this real quick, but there's instructions. Document is the additional format in case you want to employers as part of the transition jobs program Um, unfortunately, JTED is not a big grant, and wage subsidies would just eat us up. So it is um, strictly for training costs. There's, that's not an allowable cost. Um, like I said, under 3.3, that is, that is the uh, program description for your entire program. This needs to be um, concise but descriptive, can be shared with the general public, um, intent defined, and can be used in the scope of work if we decide to use that as a scope of work, part of the scope of work. Um, are administrative costs considered? They're considered, but reasonable. They must be reasonable. Like I said, um, our department's general rule is like right around 10%. So you need to keep, keep them reasonable. Um, application. Um, but these are just like um, key elements that I noted. Um, you know, in the organizational history, you need to include as an attachment your not-for-profit certification, a board list. Um, we do look at the Secretary of uh, State site for, site for um, a certificate of good standing. Um, if you could include that, that would be great. Um, we can pull that up here too, but if that would be, you know, if you include that as part of the application, that would be great. Um, a W-9, um, W-9 is basically if you become a grantee with us and you've never done work with, the, with us before or with the state before, Comptroller needs a W-9. So um, if, especially if you've not done work with the state, you need to include a W-9. Um, and that will help us evaluate to, you know, you have to have that to be able to um, have a grant obligated. And then the CCR, Central Contractor Registration. Um, I recommend that you make sure you have that and print it out and include it in the application so that we, we know you've got it. This is something we can look up too, but it'd be, you know, I recommend you include it in your application. Um, um, once again, this is you know, just kind of going through what we did on, on going through the application. Um, I want to reiterate that for employers, it's 250 for category um, employers that you're working with, 250 full-time employees or less, but that's based upon location. So then when you're, when you're picking an employer to work with, he has to have less, 250 or less employees at that location. Um, program specific category two. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze through these. This is, this is available to you also. Um, we've kind of talked about a lot of this though um, when we went through the application. Um, and you can pull this down and take a look at this. Um, 
observed and then the results of the outcome in the summary. Um, this once again talks about the activity. And how long. to do an intake on these participants to make sure that this is something that, first of all, that they're interested in and, you know, that's going to be um, something that they want to do. And then you're going to have to follow up with them. Um, like I said, we have a So we're going to buzz through this. I just want to bring this up, like I said, once again, um, the benchmarks. It is a benchmark performance base. So we negotiate that. You may come in with a specific number, and we may negotiate that. You know, I don't think we've ever negotiated up. We usually negotiate down either in, um, in the amount of funding. So we will negotiate with you if, if you're selected on, on your measures. No, we turned at the end of the grant cycle. Um, okay, two finding will the questions that that you program actor and we do it can be that scope of work scope of work Uh, dollars you will receive the entire fifty thousand thousand dollars up front um, the way that the the state general revenue operates is we have to have the funds obligated um, prior to the end of the state fiscal year. Which, so that means you may not necessarily have the money, but it will be obligated to you before June 30th. Um, when, you, when we're dealing on the Category 2 side, like I said, they are funded out of the general revenue. And with the, the structure of our state right now and the financial situation of the state right now, I, I think everybody knows that the state's behind on making payments. 
So an example is uh, my last year JTA grants that we funded, we had them obligated, you know, the early part of June, but they actually didn't receive payment until right before Christmas. It was December before they actually got a check, but they got the full amount of the amount that they were granted at that point. Um, so you also have to keep that in mind. Another very good reason why we have a two-year program is, um, you know, it could be six, seven months before you actually receive payment um, from this contract. So that's something you need to keep in mind when you're, you're structuring your training program, too. Some, some organizations are able to start the program knowing that they will be paid and, and begin training. Other organizations have to, you know, may have to wait closer to the point where they're going to receive, receive payment. So that needs to be kept in mind when you're designing your program. Um, let's see. A job readiness training is census eligible under J10. Soft skills training. You know, we don't encourage that. Um, we really want to see some hard skills training. Um, you know, Illinois WorkNet is a wonderful tool, and I really want to incorporate that into my JTA program a lot more this next year. They have a lot of resources available to in that system for for um, resume building and interview skills and that. And I really, um, we JTA is intended for developing specific skill sets um, that can get these people employed. Um, in with an employer, and 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 the the intent is to to join employers that have specific skills that they need with uh, individuals who are unemployed. So, so I, would, I would recommend no, not, not coming in. I mean, that can be a component of it, but that can't be the only component of it. Um, and I, we want to see more of the training costs going to, to some really hard skill sets. So. Um, Okay, once again, here is the information on the grant itself, June 1, 2011 through May 31st, 2013. Uh, budgets should be submitted covering that period of time. Um, grants um, will have to report quarterly. You know, to us we have a, a, a pretty um, defined reporting requirements now, and it's included in your grant application. We have a report deliverable schedule that uh, defines everything that's due to us on a quarterly basis. Um, we're looking at approximately 1.9 million, so keep that in mind. Like I said, we fund between, you know, traditionally between 23 and 24 organizations, so you know, kind of keep that in mind when you're, you're requesting funds. Um, if you're selected, um, you know, you will be required to um, take an application on these participants. You're going to be required to um, verify income eligibility. You're going to enrolled in training, um, you know, that they completed the midpoint, that they completed training, um, documentation that they were employed, documentation that they were employed after 90 days or, you know, 150, you know, if it's non-consecutive, you'd have to document that. So y you need to make sure that you have this information documented because it will be monitored. Um, and then you do report to us, like I said, on a quarterly basis on your, on your performance. So, um, like I said, we've already kind of gone through this, but you know, there's a preliminary review and then it goes out for a team review. Um, successful, successful respondents then are, we communicate back with you and we negotiate the final terms of your contract, of, of your grant with us. Because um, like I said, in many cases, what you requested sometimes doesn't necessarily mean you know, that's what ends up. Um, no cost can obviously be incurred until there is a grant. Um, sign grant with us. And then here's the submittal information. Uh, I want original and three copies. And then I also want a copy emailed to me. There's my email address, tammy.stone at illinois.gov. Um, they are due March 10th by the end of the day. At my um, um, session that I had earlier, I told them that, you know, as long as it's in by midnight, I'm happy. Um, you just make sure you get it in March 10th. And then the copies need to be um, mailed. They need to be postmarked by um, March 10th. So not necessarily meaning that I get them at, by March 10th, but they do need to be postmarked um, by March 10th. And I do believe that is about it. So why don't we open it up for any questions?
And um, of course, you can always get with me if there's any specific information that you need. Um, the first one we've already answered, there is, there is no cap. Um, the floor mode is on. To request the floor, enter star, okay. then pound. There is no minimum for training participants. You know, these are, these are individually, locally controlled training programs, and it, it, everyone is different. And like I said, it's one of the things I love about this program is because it's locally developed and designed, and it meets your specific local needs. So they're all different. Um, I think we already answered that regarding the distribution. Um, you know, Category 2 is board funded, where Category 1 comes in for cash requests. Obligation date, again, it has to be obligated by June 30th. Um, and once again, you're, when you actually receive payment, it depends upon you know, when the state has funds available. And like I said, last year it was about six, seven months before the actual payment was made. Application. The grant application is due March 10th, and we've got that already answered. Um, no wage subsidies are allowed. Uh, administrative costs, but at minimal. Um, you know, like I said, 10% is pretty much a, a standard for our department. Um, I think we I think we pretty much covered everything. I said too, it'll be available in Illinois Work Now. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so if you actually want to die, talk to us person, person to person, you can do that, and then we'll take your phone line call. So I greatly appreciate everybody participating. I hope this format works well for you. Um, you know, we're, we're anticipating doing more of this. I love the opportunity to be able to do webinars. Um, I'm hoping to incorporate this more into the actual JTED program side, too, so that I can get the grantees together and um, share information. Um, like I said, we're probably going to be looking at doing more stuff with Illinois WorkNet in the future with this grant. So, um, you know, this is a great format, and I hope everybody enjoyed this specific format. Um, is the application already online? The application is online. I am, um, you can actually download it from here. The only issue I have with the application is in one of the sections there is not a, a box. You can go ahead and use this, but it's under Section 8, Program Specific Information, under Partnerships, and where it says um, Role This Partner Plans to Play in the JTED Program. I unfortunately did not have a box there that you can enter. So um, it, you, can, you can actually, if you wanted to type it right in next to the partner name, I'm fine with that. Um, if you want to go ahead and start the application, I will update it on our website, and I can redistribute this. Um, but th that's one box that I noticed that I had left off. So, um, but besides that, you know, you can go ahead and use this application. Um, cultural specific training for various areas. I'm not a cultural specific training for various. I'm not 100% sure what you intend by that. Um, can you be a little more explicit on what you mean as far as training? is concerned with that. So, and I said once again, thank you everybody for participating. Um, if you have no more questions, you know, you can go ahead and log off the system. Do we complete the application in the Word document or do we complete it online? You complete the application in the Word document. It has to be completed in the Word document. What I recommend to do is complete it in the Word document print it, have it signed by your authorized signator with the attachments, and then, and then scan it and PDF it to me. Um, there is a naming convention that I would like for you guys to use with this application. And in the very first part of it, I want you to put your organization name. 
So it's like, I believe the file name is, um, you know, it says grantee name dash 2011 JTED application. So where it says grantee name, please replace that with your, your name so we know who the files belong to. First category. Retention. On the first day of training. The retention for category one, retention starts um, on the completion of training. So for category one, retention will start at the completion of training. For category two, retention starts when they are employed. Um, helping employees to understand how to work Jules, I have a question for you. Helping employees to understand how to work with diverse populations and enable them to communicate more e effectively. Um, I'm, like I said, once again, I'm not sure what you're, what you're getting at with that, if it's a specific training program that you're looking at doing. Um, you'd have to be a little bit more specific. And once again, like I said earlier, we want, for JTED, we want to see some good hard skills training, um, you know, and it has to be in relationship to what the local employers need. So it, it has to be a skill set that you're providing them that a local employer needs. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Like I said, if you do have any more questions, feel free to continue to, to post your questions. Um, otherwise, we are we're finished with the webinar. Thank you so much for participating, and I look forward to receiving your proposals.